Forge from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton, who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security, and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on you irons. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. This is what happens when there's an international break. In, in a change to the schedule, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's get this out of the way. Please don't forget to like, comment on, and share the stream to your social media platform. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit the bell icon for alerts of new content. As always, we thank you very much indeed for your support. Yes, as I say, in a change to the original schedule, this is now an episode of Talk West Ham. Long story short, Brian Deer, who we did have on as a live Q&A guest, unfortunately, he's had a few issues his end and he's unable to make it. So we're going to reschedule that for an alternate time. So rather than us just sort of going, OK, let's let's sort of just dump it and, and carry on with our evening. We just decided to to have a little little chit chat, Duke and I. We, we're going to stay yeah. away generally from the Southampton game because obviously we've got our match preview that will deal with that specifically but we just thought we'd have a have a little chat about all things going on around the world of West Ham since we last convened here on the channel so um Duke it's it's been there's been a lot of stuff coming out of the club and most of it hasn't been particularly good if we're being completely honest well if I may just quickly um mm -hmm. I've dumped this on as you can see, I'm yep. supporting food banks. Yes. Um, you guys may well be aware of um, what the you know what the YouTube channels are getting together to do. Um, if you haven't seen it, pop over to to West Ham Network. We have posted something on ours. Um, hashtag bring a quid, I believe, is the uh, is the hashtag. Rob, isn't it? Indeed. And we worked it out that with the seven games over, no, six games over April. Um, There'll be about 345,000 people going through the London Stadium and something like and that, in and yeah. around that area. And basically what they want us to do is uh, the Iron Supporting Food Banks, they're struggling to um, obviously continue doing what they're doing. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot more people using food banks um, with a cost of living crisis. And basically what we're saying is if we can get everyone to donate a pound, hmm. um you know, or as many people to donate a pound as we can um, over over April, um, then, you know, uh, I believe there's another company involved that are going to turn out your pound that you donate into a fiver. Yep. Um, so they've said if we can get 1% of those 345,000 people that should be going through the, the London Stadium throughout April, if we can get 1% of those to donate a pound, that actually becomes – um, twenty five thousand pound worth of food packages. That's so, a lot of feed. 
um, you know, that is, you know, and, and, and like you say, in this day and age, cost of living crisis, everything else, and the amount of people that are um, having to use the food banks, etc., to to, yep. to get by, um, this is where we can step up. And you know what, if, let's be honest, if, you know, we're a generous bunch, you know, West Ham supporters, we've seen it in the past with, with charity donations and everything else. I don't think that, 32,000 people will give a pound. I, I think we can, I think we can push a hundred thousand people donating. Um, so if we can get a hundred thousand people donating a pound, then that's half a million pound that will be raised because we'll go from that lovely dog. Um, so please guys, if you're going to be at any of the games, my, my the wife's feet at the minute. <laughs> She, my wife's just out of shot. She's doing sort of like a stock take on her laptop. Um, Winnie, in case really anybody's wondering, um, I, I, I don't know whether I discussed this too much when it happened. I probably didn't. Um, our French bulldog, um, Bubbles, we, we sadly lost six days before Christmas. Um, we're still broken hearted by it, but um, we, we got another dog. We got we got another dog, not a replacement because you it's like children or members of family. You can't replace them, but you sort of, you know, got another dog. Um, it's a Levitt Bulldog, which if you don't know what that is, it's, it's kind of essentially like an old English Bulldog. So if you've ever seen sort of paintings of Bulldogs, say, back in the 1700s, they didn't have the squashed-in face that, say, English and French yeah. Bulldogs have of today. It's just that sort of like years of breeding and, and their, their utilisation and whatever resulted in the squashed-in face and breathing difficulties and various health implications. Basically, there's a guy in America, and I believe his name is David Levitt, and basically what he did is he kind of got different breeds of dogs and over a period of time sort of like i think there was i looked it up i think there was an american pit bull terrier involved there was a, a mastiff involved i think there was an english bulldog involved and basically over a period of time he ended up with this dog that i mean duke saw her on before we went live I and mean, he, he swore blind it was a box she was a boxer yeah and she's not she's well she's 75 percent levitt 25% English basically um, gorgeous 13 weeks old and she's nibbling everything absolutely everything um, what, what happened to, to cut a very long story short well I'll stop it I'll, I'll, I'll go the long version why not we I mean she was two when we got her right and I, oh, this this is now morphed from West Talk West Ham to sort of Talk Dogs. Um, if you don't like dogs, then you might want to tune out now. If you do, then okay, fine. So we got her. She was two years old, and she, had, as you know, Duke, she had certain little quirks in her personality. I think that's fair to say. Um, I think that's an understatement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, whatever it is what it is we don't know how the first two years of her life were i suspect not very good but she was great with the family mainly um although she did have a penchant for going for george's left foot it was quite weird not his right foot his left anyway about a month before we lost her and she was quite a diminutive french bulldog and we just noticed her sort of like her hind sort of quarter just started to puff out just out of nowhere me and my wife looked at each other and we're like, what's, what's going on there? You know, we've not overfed her. We're still taking her for walks every day. This is this is a little bit out of the ordinary. So we took her to the vets and they said that she was retaining fluid and they drained the fluid off. And OK, fine, we'll see what happens. It then happened again. She puffed out again and took her back down. And this time they looked a little bit more in depth and they turned around and said, ah, there's a chamber on her heart that's not pumping properly. Well, when someone turns around and says there's a chamber on your heart that's not pumping properly, I don't know about you, but straight away I go, well, that, that doesn't sound good, does it? It's not where it should be. Yeah. So anyway, so they sort of gave her some medication and this, that and the other and all the rest of it. So I was like, okay, fine. Um, we'll sort of like we kept going back and forth and they drain her off and the, the drugs that they gave her made her basically piss everywhere they because it was trying to get rid of the fluid so anyway um didn't really sort of do too much 
And we, my wife, it was the day before the World Cup final. It was the Saturday. So the World Cup final was on the Sunday. We, my wife went down there on the Saturday to the vets. And I was working that morning. And I remember I came home and I was sitting basically in this chair. And my wife walks through the door with bubbles. And I turned around and said, so, so what are we talking? And she turned around and she said, um, heart failure. And as the words left her mouth, she just broke down and started crying. And I found it quite difficult to keep my composure at that point. So anyway, um, so I said, so where are we at? And she turned around. She said, well, she's got, she's got, we're going to send her back down on Monday. Um, but they've, they've turned around and said they can't keep doing this. They just can't. It's not fair on her. So I was like, yeah, kind of figured that bit out. Um, so anyway, the day of the World Cup final, she would, she, whilst the World Cup final was going on, she laid across us and really didn't budge. So now she was quite a energetic dog, quite vociferous. When people would walk past our front bay windows, she'd be straight up barking at them and telling them to to do one. Um, nothing, absolutely nothing. She 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 her personality had changed, and I honestly think she was depressed. So anyway. I turned around to my missus whilst the World Cup final was going on, and I turned around and I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, 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 this this will fire her up. I'm sure it will. If anybody knows the song, um, I think it was in the 70s, it was by an artist called Judge Dredd, and it was called Up With The Cock, right? The opening five, ten seconds of it is like this drum beat, which is then followed by a cockerel crowing, hence the name of the song. And she would always hear the cockerel crowing and she'd go ballistic. I mean, I'm talking rah, 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 sort of thing, you know. I mean, she was a little diminutive French bulldog. She turned into this beast um, when, oh, when Up With The Cock was played. So we played it and all I got out of her was her ear did that and that was it. Nothing. And I was like, this is not good. This is not good. So anyway, so she went down with my wife um, to the vet. So I went to work. And it got um, my, my daughter, who was the catalyst behind us getting the French Bulldog, and she chipped away at me for three years to get the Bulldog. And I, I was like, no, no, I don't want to get a dog. I don't want to get a dog. It's not fair. Blah, 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 blah. Three years, I cracked. I cracked. And we got the French Bulldog. And I'm so glad we did. Um, but on this particular day, when my wife took Bubbles to the vets for the last time, I went to work. My daughter went to Legoland with my wife's sister. It got to about two o'clock in the afternoon. And my wife phoned up and she was in floods of tears and basically said that the vets had said, time's up. You're going to, you know, the, the, your animal's suffering um, and you're going to have to sort of do, do what you got to do sort of thing. So anyway, so had to stop what I was doing, zipped around to, to, um, to the vets my, my daughter eventually came back from windsor um i was sitting in the the vets with my wife waiting for my daughter to turn up and this is where the day got even worse because whilst i'm waiting there my phone rings it's my aunt and on the same day as i lost my dog i lost my nan as well six days before christmas that was a, that was a really Kick, a real kick in the bollocks that one i gotta tell you um and yeah so my daughter turned up they they did the injection and i i'd never seen i the only time i've seen a, an animal put down is sort of like when you see it on a, a tv program and it's it's an act sort of thing they don't actually put the animal to sleep there and then it's and 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 the animal just seems to when i've seen it there the animal just seems to sort of just nod off and sort of like gently go to sleep it's not like that. If you've ever seen an animal put to sleep, it's literally they go boom. And within seconds, she just went limp and just lurched forward and, and she was gone. She was gone. And I miss her to this day. I mean, Winnie, I'll tell you what, here she is. Here she is. Ah, look at that. Look at this. Mwah. Hello. Hello. She's saying hello. She's chewing the white Look at that. Look at that. Oh God! Oh, she's got the muff. Oh, she's no. Oh bollocks! She's she's eaten, but ate 
Look at that. There used to be there used to be a foam bit there, and she's just chewed it. She's just it's, it, it, yeah. She's got a she's got a crap. Never it out work later. live with yeah. um, animals or children. Never work with children and animals. Look at this though. She is beautiful. She is absolutely gorgeous. She's she when she's full grown, she's gonna be round about Fish. just maybe a little bit smaller than a boxer. As I say, Duke thought that she was a boxer. We was out walking her yesterday. Um, and someone else thought that she was a boxer. Um, she's getting better of a night time. And, you know, the first night, I mean, bear in mind, you know, she's had the first 12 weeks of her life with her siblings, her mum and dad and, and her owners, whatever. And uh, we then took her, whisk, whisked her away for the first time in her life. She was she was very whiny and whingy the first night. But she's she's getting there. She's still getting used to things and all the rest of it. Um and yeah, she's 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 obviously she. You can't see this because she's out of shot at the minute. She's actually nibbling on my my index and middle finger. It's not sort of hurtful or anything like that. I mean, she's a baby. She's she's teething. Um, she's very nibbly, um, but she is absolutely gorgeous. And the whole family have fallen in love with her. She's beautiful. Anyway. That's talk. That's talk. Crufts. There she is. Hang on. Doggies. Say hello, Winnie. There you go. Mwah. Oh, you're a good girl. Despite the fact you ate my muff live on a stream, she ate my muff. Anyway, have a look. Have a look. Hang on. No, I, I meant to click that one. She's falling asleep. We're boring her. Anyway, I think that's bad down to me. So. What's she chewing now? Everything. Uh, hang on. What are you chewing? Winnie? Winnie, what are you chewing? Jesus Christ. Anyway, should we, should we get back to talking about West Ham? Because we've got 22 yeah, people watching and I'm, I've sort of told them about Levitt Bulldogs and Muffs and things like that. And they're probably all sitting there thinking, well, when are you going to start talking about West Ham, boys? Well, I have yeah, something to talk about, Rob. Actually. Please do. Which... Um... Which actually Thank you, is Gemma. Um, it's quite relevant considering where we find ourselves in. Even so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out there for those in the chat. Twenty one people. Um, hypothetically, okay, we get relegated at the end of the season. She's chewing on the radiator valve. <laughs> David Moyes Just gets here. a sack. David Moyes gets a sack, and you have the choice of one of two people. Okay, so you have the choice of the following two gentlemen to take over at West Ham. Now, I've been planning a video with this, um, or doing something with this information over the last over the last week or so, since we've had nothing else to do. So, obviously, the the, the front runner for in, in the West Ham fans' eyes, most of the West Ham fans' eyes, is Will Still yep. to obviously take over at West Ham. Oh. If worst comes to the worst, okay? And then obviously I have my thoughts on that, but I also Sorry, there, there is also Michael Carrick. Okay, so there are two names that I've had a little bit of a look into. Sorry, Treg. So I've had a little look into... Will still wow. and um, Will still wow. and um, she, she wants to become famous. Look at this; she, she won't leave me alone. <laughs> Will still and Michael Carrick. So I need a little look into it. So we all know that David Moyes deploys a four-two-three-one um, with no press, with with nothing else, right? Yep. So I had a little look. In, so I did a bit of research on Will Steele, yep. and I did a bit of research on Michael Carrick. Yep. Let's we'll start with Will Steele, mm -hmm. and you're going to like this. So I looked into Will Steele, and I looked into his formations, his style of tactics, his, um, his general play, right? Mm -hmm. So what formation does Will Steele play at Rems? Are you asking me? Yeah. Or is it a rhetorical question? No, no, no I'm asking you. Okay. Um, I believe 4-2-3-1. It but, is. But 
I've also been reliably informed it's very fluid and can adapt in game. That's that's my my understanding. But but its default position is four two three one. Not in the slightest, Robert. What he likes to do is now his his game his game tactics rather than his mm. formation is he likes a long ball, Rob. He loves a long ball. He loves to get the ball from front to back as quickly as he can. If that is uh, one pass or two passes, then so be it. Okay. But he loves to get the ball forwards to his um, to his striker, which I believe at the moment is Balogun, uh, the Arsenal yeah, player. Yeah, the Arsenal player, yeah. Um, and he's obviously, he's obviously got on playing well. Um, and he's he's got him doing a job, but he's technically his game management is um, he likes to get the ball forward as quickly as possible. Um, he likes to um, he likes to employ a long ball. Now, what he can do is um, what he can do is he he, he tends to employ a um a rotation in that 4231 mm-hmm. so if the left full back wants to go forward the left sided center back moves out to left back the right sided center back moves over one the right back moves into central midfield and the right winger then mm-hmm. becomes or the right sided central defender mm-hmm. will drop in so they tend to have that cover and they rotate, but essentially they stick to a four-two-three-one, and they launch. They they look long all the time. Mm. They look long. Now it seems to work for Will still. Now my other is, ouch. Um, he tends to like um, getting the ball forward as quickly as he can, and looking at the fixtures that they've played. There's only two teams in there's only two teams in the French league that are top draw. Yeah. One's PSG and one's Monaco. We know this. They're, they're the two that dominate that league year in, year they're out. Okay. Marseille are doing well. Uh, Marseille are, are, you know, the other kind of the other team that are set up on there. Mm. Again, I was talking to a couple of people last night about this. Um, friend of the channel, Paul. It was his 50th birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, Happy birthday, a, Paul. We had a couple of drinks. Um, and we got talking. And I said, if you look at the French League. So, the French League is considered one of the top five uh, footballing leagues. Yeah, So, you have the Premier League. You have um, Spain, Bundesliga, Italy, and... Um, and France. Yeah. Well, of those five, there are only two that are really competitive. And one is the Premier League and the other one is Italy. Mm. Yeah. So you only really have two or three teams in Germany, don't you? You have, um, you have Munich, Dortmund and Leipzig uh, yep. in Germany. In Spain, you have Real, you have Atletico and you have uh, Barcelona and then, obviously, in in France, you have Monaco, PSG, and Marseille. That's mm-hmm. that's pretty much it, isn't it? So, yeah. of the two of the five leagues, um, only two of them are really competitive. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So, you know, it's not overly difficult to go get results, in my opinion. In um, in France, if you're outside of the other three. Yep. He's lost one, and that was to Olympic Marseille. He got the draw against um, uh, PSG. Now, so for me, I, I can't imagine that it's, it's an overly difficult job for him. He comes in, let's say we get relegated. Is he the man to get us up? I don't know. It's a very difficult league to get out of, and the championship is incredibly, incredibly competitive and, and close, right? Mm. So then you look at... I then looked at Carrick and I took Carrick into consideration. Um, now Carrick also plays the four, two, three, one. Yep. Um, Car- but Carrick is, um, a lot more, um, 
his formation is very fluid. It actually goes from a 4-2-3-1 at kickoff to a 3-2-5 when they're going forward. It goes to three, two, a... 5 Yep, it goes, it goes to a 3-2-5 when they go forward. Blimey. Um, it goes to a 5-5-2-3 um, five, five, when they're defending. Right. Um, and he tends to play out a lot from the left or the right-hand side, Carrick. Right? I think, I think, I think my out... chin or my neck area must be quite dirty. Um, he plays out and... The, the left and right back tend to bomb on, which is what yep. then creates the three at the back. And everyone then pushes forward a position. Now, I I struggle, okay, mm-hmm. with 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 seeing um with seeing some of the comments from people, right? Oh, we get Carrick. Carrick, don't get me wrong, Carrick would be my first choice, right? Carrick would be my first choice. Now, I then go and I say, if we play, if we get Carrick and Carrick ex- expects to play in the same way that um, he does at Borough, mm-hmm. do we have the players to be able to pull that off? The answer is no. You know, we don't have the fluidity. You know, would, would we attack on the left-hand side and use Emerson? Probably. You know, he's, he's, he's not bad going forward. Same in, in the same sense as Masuaku was hmm. bloody good going forward, dog shit defending. Um, he doesn't mean you. No. Nah. Um, we couldn't do that with Sufal on the other side. That wouldn't work. You know, we don't have a, a huge amount of pace or anything up front. So then I, I went back to Will Steele and I took a look at Will Steele and his directness balls into balls into Skamaka, Skamaka holding up, um, bringing others into it. That Then that kind of works with the personnel that we have, hmm. you know, using you know, using the long ball into Skamaka, holding it up for the likes of Paqueta, Benrama, Bowen, etc., etc. So then I then I went back to well, with what we've got is we have we have a manager that wouldn't necessarily have the experience of a very competitive league. To having um, the tactical layout for the players that we have to get us back up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, me, I'd, I'd actually prefer Carrick, and then I'd actually want, um, you know, we'd have to go out and spend some money on on players to bring Carrick's vision to life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I'd, you know, I've gone from that to being, you know, kind of thinking, well, we'll still needs to be the one that comes in because with the personnel we have, his tactics would work for us. Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm kind of, ah, um, it's, it's a, it's a difficult one. What, what do you think? Well, like, what's your thoughts on those two? Well, specifically on those two, whether I think that they would be my choice or not, if we, if we're going to sort of just concentrate on those two, I think it's a flip them, Duke. I, I really do. I can see pros and cons for them both. I think obviously the, the there's there's a hell of a pull for for Carrick for for a number of reasons. One being that he's he's got experience, limited though it was, managing Manchester Manchester United in a caretaker role, and then obviously Borough at the upper end of the Championship. So he's obviously got the experience in English football whereas will still really doesn't yeah. i know you can turn around and say well he managed preston's under 14s that's a different entity entirely um look i mean will but will still i mean i to be honest every time i've heard the guy speak i think he's he comes across really well i think he's very he's a very impressive young man now what what he goes on to achieve in the game remains to be seen but he's 30 years of age 
And he's he's doing an absolutely sterling job in yes, okay, it's it's not it's not La Liga, it's not the Premier League, it's not the Bundesliga. I get that. But he's got the job that he's got and he's doing what he's doing, and he's he's doing a bloody good job with not a PSG, not a Monaco, not a Marseille, with Stad Rem. So I I think that either one of them would be a better bet than David Moyes with all due respect. Look, and again, I've said it before, I will say it again. I have an awful lot of gratitude for what David Moyes has done in, you know, two relegation battles that have been successfully negotiated, sixth place, seventh place, European semi-final, and another European qualification that we're obviously in the midst of that particular competition. But I just think his time's up, mate. And I, I, it's it's got to the point. I mean, the thing that worries me, right, one of the things, and this is sort of like where I'm going to touch on what I wanted to talk about, which which obviously will dovetail with what you're talking about, with all these rumours, stories, reports coming out of Rush Green, of basically David Moyes isn't listening to his coaching staff Kevin Nolan, from what we're being told, if the reports are to be believed, is basically not being given any sort of input. Basically, already the input he is having, Moyes is basically overruling the geezer. And I put it on a message earlier. It's like if I was Kevin Nolan, if that if he was going to work and he's sort of like going in and saying, right, OK, um, I'm going to coach you this, 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 this. And David Moyes is just going bollocks. Well, I'm actually, I'm going to do something that's 180 degrees removed from that. It's like, well, then Kevin Mo- Nolan may as well not be there. And that's not me being funny to Kevin Nolan. I've got a lot of time for Kevin Nolan. But that's so funny. Well, but well. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. any of the coaches. But the thing yeah. is, it's like I turned around and said, if I was him, I would do an Alan Kirbishly and I'd, I'd resign and then sue the fucking club for constructive dismissal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's... It's like he, he can't perform his fundamental role, which is coaching the first team players. Well, I if mean, you're going to have a manager, if, that's I, if, I may, if I may just quickly jump in and say um, one thing, and that is there is no, uh, there, there has been no um, guarantee, shall I say? that it obviously came from Kevin Nolan. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people have put two and two together. There, There is a video on another West Ham channel where um, this this is discussed, um, everything that we're talking about, um, mm-hmm. um, you know, certain things that have been said, etc. And, you know, people are putting two and two together and coming out that it was Nolan that has obviously made certain comments. There, there, there is no... Um, There's no evidence that it is definitely Nolan. That's that's what mm-hmm. I want to get. Okay, so I, I want to get that quite clearly across that it isn't that there is no guarantee. I don't want to put us in a situation, um, Rob, where you know he goes, "Well, I didn't fucking say that." What are you on about? I don't want to, I don't want that to be the case for us. Um, I mean, listen. I, I, I made a I made a comment after Winnie Sharky. I made a comment after the video um, was doing the rounds in in certain WhatsApp groups, and I actually made a comment that the players, certain players, the likes of um, you know Skamaka, Benny, they they all have a case for taking taking it to a tribunal, Rob, because of the way that they have been treated. If this is mm. true, what we are being led to believe was said by a member of the backroom team, I'll put it that way, then that, then, then there is a case in there for um, harassment. There is a case in there for bullying. You know, mm-hmm. we could be fucked. But then also Sullivan and um, Kratinsky, Brady, they've all got to be involved in this because they've allowed it to continue. They obviously know what is, is obviously going on. Um, you know, we saw, we, we, we've actually seen yeah. some of what's been spoken about, haven't we? When we talk about, um, mm. when we talk about Nolan, you know, Nolan on the touchline with Moyes 
you know, throwing the his iPad. arms up and walking away because he um because he was told to fuck off, basically. You know, and then there was the one with Declan Rice on the touchline, you mm. know, throws his That's water bottle down. Moyes doesn't want to listen to people. You know, mm. he has his it basically it's his way on the highway. Um, and we're seeing that with Skamaka. Um Control with, freak. Yeah, well, he is massively, and he doesn't want to give anything up, Rob. And this is this is what's going to cost us, I believe. Mm. Um, just to sort of backtrack, she she was called Winnie, shortened version of Winston Reed, which is why my daughter picked. Basically, she was from a litter, and they all the all the pups had West Ham centric names. So this was Winnie after Winston Reed. There was Carlton Frank. Dixie, uh, bu- 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 Bubbles, and Bonzo were the names. So, yeah. So, there you go. Um, Kent's jumped in. Good evening, Kent. Hope you are well. I saw your, saw your dinner a little bit earlier, I've got to say. I hope mine is up to that standard. And if it isn't, I will be having words. Anyway, um, Moyes' time was up after the Leicester, the Leicester game before the World Cup. Gaffer ruins expensive creative players with his negative tactics and his refusal to change. Kent, you must be in my head, literally, because that is pretty much where I'm at. In fact, I've been there for quite some time. I've been there from the Leicester game, as I've said many times. Yeah, That's when we should have just sort of said, thank you very much for your service, Mr. Moyes. The thing is, it's now got too far, and I, I think that if we'd have... If we'd have got rid of him after the Leicester game, hypothetically, I think he would have still been able to leave this club with a, an, a reasonable amount of the supporter base at large still having a, a great deal of respect and good feelings for David Moyes. And if and when he came back later, you know, down the track, I think he would have been well received. I'm not quite sure that that's the case now. I think it's turned quite toxic. Oh, massively so. Massively so. Um, I've got, I got something to bring to the table here that was released an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Got a question. Far away. Obviously, we know that we've had these issues in the past, money problems, okay? Yep. <clears throat> Have you seen what's come out about Manchester United? No, but I know, obviously, that Everton are under the microscope for the old financial fair play. And that that comes under financial play, fair play. I don't, I, want, I don't want to talk about that because I can't stand that, yeah. that whole shenanigans of that. Talk about Manchester United's debts, Rob. Have you seen this? Manchester United owe $969 million, 600000 through a combination of gross debt, bank borrowings, and outstanding transfer fees with associated payments, according to new figures. But they can service that debt, right? Well, this, there's a reason that they're being sold, Rob, is because the Glazers can't fund it. But my question is, how how has a club been allowed to get to this situation when we have things like as you brought it up a moment ago, financial fair play. They're obviously borrowing beyond the means that they've got. So, you know, we, we've seen all of this about Manchester City recently, and if found guilty, whatever punishment needs to fit the crime, et cetera, et cetera. And yep. I, I believe there's something like 93 law breaches, is there, over nine years, something like this, uh, which I believe includes falsifying figures. Yep. Of of um, all the accounting, yeah. Uh, um, was it Mancini? Was Mancini Man City manager? He was, wasn't he? Yeah, and I think he also had another gig where apparently he was down as a coach in Abu Dhabi or somewhere like that, wasn't it? To get it round, sort of like the tax and all that. Yeah, bollocks. it was basically <laughs> well. From what I'm being led to understand is he had two contracts at Manchester City, one that was ratified and one that wasn't, mm. uh, which doubled his fee. Um, and then there was the one where they, the, the extra payment for Jack Grealish. Mm. You know, when he makes his first start for the club, you get an extra 50 million quid or something stupid like that. So mm. it basically... Um, 
Aye, aye, Trini. Yep. Yeah, I've heard that as well. So it just, I'm, I'm, I'm just very shocked <laughs> by um, the fact that even Manchester, uh, even really? Tottenham, Tottenham were in a billion pound in debt as well after lockdown oh, because of their it's... stadium. So I just, I, just I, don't, I don't understand, Rob, how these clubs are able to get away with it. Because they've got very, very um, clever accountants, very very clever lawyers, the best legal teams, and they can sort of push it under the carpet. And if and if all else fails, they can just hand a fucking large brown envelope stuffed full of used £20 notes under the table. And guess what? The problem goes away. Um, hey, doing Am Hammer 89? Yeah, I'm, I'm all good, mate. I'm, uh, I've, I've got my, my little, my new puppy in, in my arms and she's just dropped off asleep. Uh, Bless. Yeah. It is. It's like having a baby again. It really is. Like <laughs> baby toddler, that sort of that sort of thing. Honestly, it's ridiculous. But now nah, listen, mate. I all this stuff about Man City, 90 odd charges, they could get relegated. Oh, do me a favor, they ain't getting fucking relegated. If you believe that, you probably still believe in the tooth fairy. It's not gonna happen. They'll just hand over a fucking large brown envelope, as I say. The problem will go away. They'll get a slap on the wrist. It'll, I mean, look, do you, do you remember the European Super League, for Christ's sake? There was all this stuff about yeah. the Premier League were going to do this, the FA were going to do that, the UEFA were going to do this. Uh, and what, what did they get? What was it, about a £10 million fine or whatever it was each? I mean, they were, they probably turned around and said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we've got that in our back pocket. Would you want it now? Do you want it? What do you want it in? £20 notes, £50 notes? What do you want? Yeah, exactly, and it, that's it means nothing. Not to these clubs, no. Uh, and that's a, and, and for me, that's the frustrating part, Rob. Mental, mental. But what we got here from Paul? Uh, final game last season, Brighton away. Oh yeah, that was that went well, didn't it? We was one nil up there, and we lost it three one. Moyes slated the players, saying that he had run into the. That, sorry, Moyes slated the players that he had run into the ground. Correct. The same players that he kept picking yeah. despite them running on empty. That was when I wanted him gone. Don't blame you, Paul. Don't blame you. Um, I mean, the whole of the 2022, the calendar year of 2022, we were piss poor in the league and there's no getting away from that. You can sit there and you can turn around and say, you know, well, we got to a European semi-final when we did, but let's be honest, that papered over the cracks massively. It was it was a diversion from what was going on. The, the, your Premier League is always your bread and butter, dude. You know that. I know that. That is that is your bread and butter. For your, your European competition, should you be lucky enough to get it, and it's great, but that should never, ever be at the expense of your Premier League form. It just shouldn't. I mean... Let's let's have it right. We win the conference league. Now look, I've I've got a very, very grainy recollection of nineteen eighty, right? Other than that, I've got what? A, a, a couple of playoff wins. Um that's that's basically it. Yeah. So I've got nothing else to sort of grab onto. So do I want to win the conference league? Yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. But if it came in any way, shape, or form, at the expense of Premier League survival, no way, no way, absolutely not. Um, just to answer this question from Hammer eighty nine, I guess again, and I've, again, I've said it before: when we played Wolves, when we played Everton, it, it kind of depends upon if we get beat. Is it a humiliation? Is it a three four nil defeat where we looked we look completely? Just off, like another another sort of bright and away performance. If it is, then there's every possibility, especially if the crowd turn. Once I think when the crowd, if the crowd goes like they did against in in the Brighton game away, but we're talking sixty two thousand home support, and you've got like what you had in the Burnley game, where you've got a congregation of very very angry West Ham fans just below the director's box, hurling all sorts of abuse and obscenities and all of the rest of it. There's every possibility, but I think unless that happens, I think if we got beat, say 2-1, but we played reasonably well on the day, I think they'd keep him. I think they'd turn around and say, 
we was unlucky to lose there and there's shoot there's signs of of shoots of, of recovery and all, all of this bollocks whether that's right or wrong uh, you know i mean uh, there's there's i'll tell you what i'll share it with the class i've got it here ready to go let me just press this button here and share this with you this is this is on um i'll tell you what, let me let me get rid of that i'll go full screen with it um this is on the one football website and it's from 90 minutes and it it makes the claim that we're planning for david moyes to basically be departing at the end of the season, whatever happens, whether we retain Premier League status, whether we win the Conference League, there's there's whispers that David Moyes is, is gone at the end of the season, whatever he does. I mean, th- it, we, we shouldn't be sort of... It shouldn't be up for discussion as far as I'm concerned. He's failed. He was given... He was backed. Whatever you want to say about Gold... Uh, sorry, the late David Gold... Um, David Sullivan, Daniel Kutinsky, Karen Brady, whatever you want to level at them, good, bad or indifferent. The one thing you can't level at them is that they didn't back the manager in the summer when he needed finances, when he needed to sort of reboot the team, refresh the squad. He, he was backed. He had the third highest budget of any club in world football and he has squandered those funds he has taken a 35 million pound striker and destroyed his confidence he has he has absolutely turned the guy into yeah. sebastian haller mark two that i can completely agree with you so i just i mean ken if he's still in the chat which he probably is i mean he's he said it, he, he turns strikers into substitutes yeah. he's, he's all right at turning wingers into strikers but as far as sort of like keeping strikers operating at the level that got them through the door in the first place no nah. no he doesn't it, it's, it's stupid isn't it really i mean it, it really frustrates me because this is italy's number nine we're talking about rob and and you know what's what? you know, yeah, but you know what I find amusing? The guy that has replaced him yep. in the Italy team against England and scored against England is the guy that West Ham are now looking to replace Skamaka with at West Ham. He can't speak Italian, apparently. No, he's, he's Argentinian. Argentinian. But he yeah. gets it through the Irish grandmother rule. <laughs> well, there's a lot of Argentinians that have Italian heritage, if you sort of look. Um a lot of their surnames are sort of like Italian sounding. There's yeah. a lot of lot of ancestry. I mean, but I mean, obviously, as far as FIFA's concerned, it's grandparents. It doesn't go to great par- grandparents and all the rest of it. But yeah, he's he's Argentinian, but playing for Italy. Whereas the Italian striker that we bought, we've just smashed his confidence to pieces. And yeah, I mean, he he was on the bench against England, Trini. You're right, and he came on. And do you know how many touches he had on on in his two minute cameo? Zero. He didn't touch the ball once. Um, and I'm not. That's not. That's not me having a pop. That really isn't me having a pop. It's, it's not but the thing fault. is, is that you know when he turned up at West Ham, he was Ital- Italy's starting number nine. He's now all he's worthy of is a place on the bench and two minutes off of it. And that's down to that. That's down to David Moyes. David Moyes oh, is completely is. responsible for that. Because of his his shit utilization, I mean, look, he came from Sassuolo in Serie A. Now, if you actually look, Sassuolo played with mainly what I've seen of it: four three three formation yeah. with Raspadori and Berardi either side of Scamacca. Sometimes it would be a two, but a lot of the time it would be a, a three up top. Now, an awful lot of the time when we've played with Skamaka, he's been played as a lone striker. So we've, it, it does make me wonder about all these bollocks about, oh, David Moyes with his due diligence, you know, his fabled demo T. And you sort of sit there and go, hold on a minute. This is a guy that, that played in a, in a front two slash front three for the club that he was at last season. That's prompted you to hand over the best part of 36 million pounds to the, to the selling club. 
And you're playing him in a, in a role and in a formation that is completely alien to him. What the fuck are you doing? But what else do we expect, Rob? This this is this is what he does. We've oh, seen it already. Me. He has precedence with it, Rob, because he did it to Hilaire. Yeah, of course he does. I mean, yeah. the only thing I would give him a little bit of leeway with Sebastian Hilaire, he didn't buy Sebastian Hilaire. Hilaire was here when he walked through the door. No, but have a look at, Matter, have, have a look at what Hilaire went and done. Oh, After we yeah. sold him if you use him right. Yeah, 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 massively. I, I, yeah. I knew that. I knew that. And all right, you could make the case that, oh, yeah, but it was for IX in the Eredivisie. But yeah, but hold on. He, he banged in goals in the Champions League, for Christ's sakes. It wasn't like he was playing a against a bunch of Dutch florists, for fuck's sake. He was playing against proper teams. Yep. And this is the frustrating part, and he'll do well. Now he's, well, now he's getting back to fitness after, obviously, his health scare. Which I'm really pleased to see that he's come out the other side of. Um, he, you, you will see, you will see him flourish at Dortmund. You really mm. will. Yeah, that I'm convinced of. Yeah, she's she is spark out here, mate. Honestly, <laughs> she is. I'll tell you what. Hang on, let me just get rid of that. If anyone is still sort of like the star of the show's here, there she is, having a nice little kip on her daddy's lap. Bless her. Anyway, uh, I don't know, mate. I mean, like I say, um, I don't want to talk too much about the Southampton because we're going to do that on the on the match preview that we're going to do on Saturday. Um, but yeah, I, I just we're in the bottom three, mate, and we're in the bottom three for a reason. The table doesn't lie. We've been crap all season. Oh yeah. There's been games that we've won. Let's let's be completely honest about it. We was asshole lucky to get the win away at Villa, our first league win of the season. We was asshole lucky to get the win against Bournemouth. We was asshole lucky to get the win against Fulham. Right. Well, that's that's half of our wins in the Premier League this season that you can look at and go, well, Jesus Christ, that was they we were fortunate to get all three points in each of those games. Well. If if we drew those games, I mean that's that's six points that we're we're less. I mean fucking hell, we we bottom of the table in that case, aren't we? It is so tight down there. Thank you. Oh, the league. Sorry. No, not later, dear. Later. In your dreams. Not at all. Not even now. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, you go back to uh, uh, how close and, you know, three points moves us out mm -hmm. of that bottom part, then it? Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. As I said before, though, on, on another video um, with you guys, a better result than three out of the other eight. That's all it has to be. A better result than three out of the other eight. Uh, Even how if confident are you with David Moyes at the helm? I believe, listen, I believe we out. can get a better, listen, I, I believe we can get a better result than three of the other eight around us. I wish I had your confidence. I'm, I'm confident we can get a result on each, each Premier League game that even if it's just a point more mm. than those that are in and around us, it's a, it's a point gained, it's a better result. I believe we can do that. I do believe we can do that. So it's just wow. a case of, you know, each day, Rob, that's all it is now. But it's you're relying good. upon David Moyes selecting an 11, selecting a formation, and sending them out there with a strategy, more importantly. And that's what it, it hinges on, Duke. You can put whatever set of players out there you want. You can have whatever set of players on the bench that you want. If your general strategy relating to the tactics on the pitch, relating to how you're going to adapt to what your opposition do during the 90 that changes the dynamic that changes the pick the questions that they're posing to you and your utilization and this is the key for me your utilization of substitutes that everybody knows what you're going to do you're going to make substitutes unless there's an injury or a sending off your substitutions are going to come around about minute 70 and you'll probably make two of them maybe three 
I don't think you'll get to four substitutes. There's no way you're getting to five substitutes. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, you know that. I know that. Every Premier League. I mean, that's like playing a game of, of Texas Hold'em, dude. You might as well play it with your cards face up. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> I'll it's, give you that. It's, it's, it's just so utterly predictable. You know, I've, I, you know, look. Do I hope we will we're gonna do what you're saying and get better results than three of the teams around us? Yeah. Do I have confidence that it's gonna happen under this manager? No. Yeah. Well, it ain't gonna get any better. We're, we're where we Even are. Top but top. Him. Hmm. It's that exactly. simple. And, it, and and if we go down, it's entirely on him because Amanda said it earlier. We've we've got arguably arguably, our best squad in goodness knows how long. But the way that they've been used, I mean, fuck me, square pegs in round holes. Round holes all the time. Really? The time. You know, it's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, was, I was wondering. I mean, you know, being in Lewisham, you could probably get a few, a few little sort of packets of the old... Uh, Colombian marching dust, I'm quite sure. Take me to your dealer. <laughs> anyway. Um, as I say, guys, um, this, this was meant to be Brian Deere's Q&A. And apologies um, for that's not come to pass. Brian's just, like I say, he had a, a couple of problems his end. And rather than us sort of, just disappearing into the night and letting everybody down. We just decided to sit here, have a little waffle. I've been I've been joined by my my thirteen week old puppy, who I think has probably stolen the show, Duke. I'd say so. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we've been going for about an hour. Is there any any final points you want to make before we knock it on the head, old chap? No, I'm all good, mate. I'm all good. I've I've did the little bit about Will Steele and Michael Carrick that I wanted to get off my chest. So, yeah, fair. Right, well, just a couple of things left to say. There's 37 of you watching. Do us a favour. Don't forget to drop a like on the stream. I'm looking here. Unless, I, unless I'm reading this wrong, we've got 21 likes. It would be absolutely brilliant if all of you, well, 38 watching now, could just, before you disappear and let yourself out, just drop a like on the stream. It really would help the channel out tremendously. Um, don't forget to comment on it, share the stream to your socials, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You know the drill. If you've been around here for long enough, you know what to do by now. And if you haven't been around here for that long, then don't forget to subscribe before you let yourself out and hit that bell icon. You know it makes, it makes sense. sense. And the other thing that makes sense is to support the Iron Supporting Food Bank charity. That makes sense, doesn't it, Duke? Yes, of course it does. Absolutely. Bring a quid. Bring a quid. Don't forget. Come on, you irons. Let's let's do a little bit of good and help help the people out in our community that need it. See you next time. Forge from Iron is proud to support Iron Supporting Food Banks. They are a group of West Ham United fans and friends inspired by the work of other football fan food banks around the country. They collect food and cash donations from Newham Food Bank in Beckton, who supply seven distribution centres in the borough, seven days a week, and hand out several hundred three-day emergency food packs every month to families in need. They are also working with other groups to improve conditions for vulnerable adults and children in the Newham community. They are supported in their efforts by West Ham United Football Club, the WHU Foundation, LS185, London Legacy Development Corporation, Newham Council, the Met Police, Spire London East Hospital, Expedient Security, and a large number of West Ham and football fans. You can help by making a donation to their Just Giving page. You will find the link to this in the description section of the video details in this stream. Thank you for your support. Come on, you irons. <laughs>